G'day Internet, welcome back to another video. Now, as a vintage computer collector and enthusiast, there are certain machines that one day I would love to own, but have kind of resigned myself to knowing that I probably never will, so it all just comes down to reading about them online, watching other people's videos and looking at photos. This machine right here is actually one of those. So for me at least, in this particular occasion, I've managed to tick a machine off that list. Now, before we actually get to the machine, first some excuses. Uh, we think this machine has been sitting in a storage container for about probably 15 to 20 years, right? And it was basically taken out, put in the back of my mate's car and bought to me. Uh, I have already done a little bit of work on this machine. Apologies, I was a little excited when I got it. Uh, primarily around sorting out some wiring in the back for the power supply. So if you notice a non-standard power switch on the back, uh, that was me and I'm waiting for the proper switch to arrive. Uh, the other thing is, is that this machine, some point in its life, had had a particular upgrade. Uh, and I have since downgraded it to what this machine should have come with originally. Now, with all that out of the way, what is under the cover? Well, going by the shape, you can probably guess, but I'd like to kind of keep the illusion up a little. Uh, so here we go. Yes, it is a Commodore PET, uh, a 4032 to be exact. So why a PET? Well, I think we can all probably agree that they're a fairly iconic machine. I absolutely love the all-in-one shape. Uh, and it is one of the holy trinity, as they like to call it, from 1977. I own an early-ish Apple II, that's the Euro Plus. Uh, I have a Tandy TRS-80 Model 1, and now I have a pet. Now, when this machine was offered to me, I actually had a choice of two. This 4032 and an original 2001. So you might be asking, given that I have the Apple II and the TRS-80 Model 1, why didn't I get the 2001? And it was a hard decision. It primarily came down to this. I asked a stack of people, uh, pet owners, uh, other enthusiasts. Uh, I messaged Adrian and kind of went, hey, which one should I get? Uh, and the answer unanimously came back is that the 2001 is obviously the more iconic machine, uh, but the 4032 is easier to live with and keep running. Primarily, this comes down to parts availability uh, and to a lesser degree documentation as well. Now, given that, it's also because I've sort of learnt my lesson a little with the Apple II and the TRS-80. Uh, both those machines, essentially, every time I do power them up, I shake a magic eight ball and I go, will you work today? Uh, and for both those machines, it's probably 50-50. Now, those machines have all been sorted. Uh, they're just, well, they're just a bit old and cranky, to be honest. The 4032 is obviously not a baby by any stretch of the imagination, but they had gotten a lot of things sorted out by the time this was released in 1980. Now, given everything that I have just laid out, uh, including the fact that this thing sat in a storage container for many, 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 many years, uh, aside from the little bit of work that I've done, the biggest surprise on this machine is as follows. It works. Yes. Once I'd sorted out that wiring in the power supply, it booted straight up. Now, when I did get it, it booted straight into 80 column mode. And I decided to downgrade it, which is basically just a case of moving some jumpers around. It's not that exciting uh, and burning a new ROM. But the reason is, is this is a 4032. This is how it should be. Uh, but also, I kind of get the impression, now, excuse me if I'm wrong, but 
a lot more software is available for the 40 column machines than it is for the 80 column ones. At least software that may interest me, and let's be honest, that's probably mostly games. But here we are, it boots, uh, but that is kind of about it. You may not be able to tell on camera, but the screen is quite dim. I've got the brightness up as far as I can before the raster lines appear. Uh, and on this machine, uh, one key works most of the time, and it is the exclamation point. And that's kind of it. Oh, I think the shift lock key works as well. The shift lock key. And that's it. Um, so the keyboard is going to need going through. Uh, but that will be a subject for a future video, probably part two, I'm guessing. Uh, what I desperately want to do to this machine right now is to basically get rid of 20 years of dust inside and out. So step one is going to be stripping this thing down to its bare essentials. Uh, I have had some of this apart, so I kind of know what I'm doing, but from about here upwards, I'm not sure, and so we'll be discovering that together. So one of the design features of the pet is something that everyone seems to love, and that's the, simply the way it opens up, and it has its little kickstand. But to kind of help me work on this, I did discover that if I get something reasonably solid, like this little wooden box, uh, I can put it at the back, and kind of without putting too much stress on the hinge, I can kind of sit it like this, and it makes it a little easier to work on. So first things first, I want to get the uh, main board out. So let's disconnect, uh, what's that? That's the video signal, power, and keyboard. Uh, there are three screws. And yes, look, I'm using anti-static. Uh, quick side note, uh, I modified my bench the other day, uh, so the entire outer uh, edging is now actually tied to ground, and I, oh, you can't see it, I've put studs in uh, the whole way around so I can attach myself. Uh, that's all three screws, uh, and then there's uh, three clippy standoffy things. So, one, two, and three, come on, uh, and there's our main board. Next I'm going to attempt to remove the top half, which is four bolts or nuts underneath, uh, but I do need to desolder the power uh, that goes to the CRT, which I'm assuming is 12 volts. So let me get out my soldering iron and we'll do that. Righto. Uh, you go away and you go away. Right. And lastly, hidden down the back corner here is, and I believe it's a 7mm, that's not a 7mm spanner. I'm sure I had a 7mm spanner handy. Anyway, there is a, a lug with a nut on it for ground, so I'm assuming that earths out the entire chassis. One nut and one little washer, and that should release ground strap which runs to the power supply, uh, another ground strap which runs to the power supply somewhere, uh, and the one that runs up into the CRT unit. And I should now have all the wires free which run to the top. Now, here's the bit I'm concerned about, and that's kind of, I don't want the CRT to fall as I back these off. But first, what I really need to do is simply work out what size spanner they are. Okay, they are not a 9. Right, they seem to be an 8, which means they're probably something Imperial. Uh, yeah. Uh, we also have... Oh, okay, hang on. 
got a series of screws and bolts. I think the CRT control board is mounted separately from the chassis. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I'll pull those out first. That screwdriver's way too big. And two of them are missing. Okay. That should be fun to put back together because you've got to kind of then have to... Anyway. Uh, right, let's take the bottom ones out. I don't really need to be wearing that, it's just getting in the way now. Okay, actually here's a thought, I probably should have taken the hinge off and then just lifted the whole thing off. Let's do that. I haven't gone too far. Right, uh, boxy thing out of the way. Right, the hinge is these screws along the back. And hopefully this doesn't end too much in tragedy, given that one's finger tight. So, if my theory is correct, I should just now be able to pick this whole thing up and put it to one side. I can. Nice. Uh, right. Um, next. Uh, seeing as while it's in front of me, let's get the power supply out. Uh, which requires cutting these zip ties. I've got replacements, they're only zip ties. Uh, we've got two screws here and two screws here. And this should lift up and pull through. Pull the power plug through and there is our power supply unit. I'll just carefully put that to one side. Uh, and there is, there is our base plate ready for some cleaning. Okay, now the top half. I think I want to put it on its side like this. Because that probably supports both halves the best. Uh, let's remove these last two bolts, nuts, whatever. It's a good thing I'm filming this because I'll be able to go back over my footage and work out how the hell this thing all goes back together. Right, this should, well I thought it should separate. Is it just kind of a bit stuck? No, there's nothing left holding this thing together. There's no, oh, there's two screws at the back. Uh, right, I didn't even see those. Uh, one, Okay, now does it come apart? Oh. No. But this whole back half seems to be loose. Um, Alright, let's carefully try and flip it back over. And... Ooh! Okay, it's actually not as bad as I thought it was going to be, because I would actually like to try and keep this together as much as possible because it's a CRT and it gives me the willies. 
what I should really do now is, I think, put all those nuts and screws back in. Right, that's the top half kind of re-secured. Um, we're obviously not going too bad because of, look, I've already started putting stuff back together. <laughs> right. So where we're gonna go from here is uh, everything's gonna get hit with an air compressor because I generally find that's a good start. Um, I'll then use a brush to kind of brush as much stuff out dry as I can. Um, I'm actually surprised how little soot and stuff there is around the CRT. I mean, there's a bit, but it's not horrendous. Um, and then I guess we simply start wiping the whole thing down, probably with some Windex uh, inside out and back to front. So, I think it's time for a montage. Well, I'm pleased to report that not only has it literally changed color, I didn't kill it either. So I've gone ahead and obviously put it all back together and we now have a much cleaner Commodore PET. I'm pretty sure it's changed color, um, but here it is uh, looking quite presentable. But in the process of doing, you know, the last two hours or whatever of cleaning on this machine, it occurred to me that right about now I would be finishing the video uh, with a very clean pet, but one that I still couldn't use because that keyboard is still faulty. It's not really the best way that I would like to end a video. So, let's keep going. Uh, let's pull that keyboard back out and see what we can do about it. So here is our keyboard. It is filthy duty, as you can tell. Uh, and like I said before, one key sort of works and that's about it. Now, it is entirely possible that the fact that only one key works has actually got something to do with the computer. Uh, if that is the case, I'm basically shit out of luck uh, because I don't have anything, I don't have another pet to compare it to, uh, and that ends up in a whole different world of pain. Uh, so for now, I'm just going to concentrate on the actual keyboard and hope that is the problem. Now, if I understand this correctly, this is the kind of keyboard that uses basically plungers with a little carbon point on the end uh, onto a circuit board, if I've got my information right. 
Now, there's various ways of cleaning that up. Some people use very light sandpaper, some use the uh, A4 paper trick, which I've done in the past to some success. Um, but for an entire keyboard that isn't working, that's not something I really want to do because you end up spending three hours going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you eventually get all the keys to work. But it would seem for a previous project that I never actually got round to, I bought myself uh, a CircuitWorks rubber keypad repair kit from Chemtronics. So what I am going to do is I'm basically going to go straight to uh, repainting all the little carbon pads on the bottom of the plungers of the key switches. But first we need to pull this apart and I of course have misplaced, uh, it is geographically embarrassed, uh, my key cap puller. I cannot find it anywhere. I've looked uh, high and low and no. So I'm going to have to attempt to do this the hard way and pray I don't break any key stems. Ah, we have springs. Okay. I should have seen that coming. Right, container to put springs in so I don't lose them. Because if I don't, I know what's going to happen. Try to do this as carefully as I can. Whoops. No, keycap stays out. Right, by some absolute miracle, I didn't break a single key stem. Touch wood. Um, so, these are all going to go soak in some uh, hot soapy water. Uh, the springs are going to be carefully put to one side and then we will start to tackle this. So here is our very filthy uh, keyboard. I think I'm going to start by simply at least, should we call it brushing the big chunks off? I don't know if I'm really doing much good here, but uh, it makes me feel better. Uh, interesting, I don't know if you can see that. I guarantee at some point in this computer's life there was a spill there, just at a guess. All right, that's marginally less bad. Now, how does this thing come apart? What are the chances it's like a Commodore 64 keyboard and I'm about to jump into a million tiny little screws. Uh, oh, okay. Does that come off? Looks like some kind of clip. Oop, clip. And yes, it's a tiny, it's a bunch of tiny little screws. Okay. For a tiny bunch of tiny little screws, I need a tiny little screwdriver. I found a tiny little box. A tiny little wooden box. That will do nicely. Okay, here we go. All right, before I take these last ones out and the thing moves, it would also seem I need to desolder the shift lock. This is feeling very Commodore 64-ish. That shouldn't really surprise me, of course. Red goes to the top. Can someone remind me of that later? Top. Right, last screws. And what horrors will await us? Um, well, it's very dirty. So that's going to get scrubbed with some IPA. These, they don't look completely horrible, put it that way. Uh, what I think I am going to do, and I may regret this, is I'm actually going to empty them all out and paint them separately, I guess, and then drop them back in. Uh, at first glance, they look all identical, so I don't need to try and like, uh, you know, keep them in order. Actually, can I do this? What happens if I do this? Well, at least that, ah, I was about to say at least they didn't go flying and then I go and bump the damn thing. Right. So that is now completely just a bit of plastic and one metal bar. So that can actually just go get scrubbed. 
Let's carefully, so I don't lose any of them, push all these to one side. Uh, and, well, while I've got it, and I have my IPA sort of handy, um, I actually got rid of the bulk of it. Uh, okay. IPA. Uh, some cotton buds. Uh, my paper towel was here a second ago. Don't actually expect this to turn out too dirty, but we'll see. No, honestly, sweet bugger all actually came off that. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Because the downside is that, well, it's not going to be the PCB. Uh, this looks like it's had a couple of bodge repairs, but everything looks fine now. Right, uh, plastic plate, scrub, and then I'll start on these. What I think I'm going to do here is I'm going to give each one a slight white with some IPA and then paint it. Right, reading the instructions we have, I'm guessing this is called part A, oh yeah, part A, part B. So basically pour part B into part A, stir like buggery, uh, and then thinly paint the contacts. Righto. There's not much in there, is there? Okay. I should make a mess of this with my clumsy big hands. Tip all of that in there. Instructions had big warnings about not doing partial mixes. So, all right. Stir like buggery for 30 seconds. Now, I'm guessing this should be the consistency of something like model paint, uh, which I do have at least some familiarity with, so I think that's the consistency I will go with. Uh, and try and stir out as much of the marble in this that I can see. Which doesn't seem completely possible. All right, and then paint. So I'm actually going to try and get, because there isn't much here. So let's see how much of this I can get off my mixing doohickey. Uh, put that there, make a mess later, and... Okay, one, many more to go. Righto, there we go. They've all been painted. Uh, there's quite a lot of them. Now, the instructions say to let them sit for 24 hours or... Hang on a minute, where are they? Uh, where are those instructions? Do, 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 do. Dry is tack-free in one hour. Repaired keypads can be returned to service in 24 hours. For faster curing, uh, heat repair to 90 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes and allow to cool. Now, I've got nothing to easily uh, heat these up to 90 degrees Celsius, uh, but what I do have is an old incandescent lamp, uh, so I think I'll just stick them under that for a few hours. Right, so after a buttload of work, the keyboard is back together and... Please work. Uh, We're looking good. Shift lock. Does shift not lock do anything? Oh, hadn't locked in, right.
and yes, I have a completely working keyboard on my pet. That makes this machine completely operable. That's awesome. <laughs> and there we go. There is my fully functional and very clean pet. Uh, looking quite majestic. Uh, and now I have a keyboard that works. Uh, and I'm very happy about that. Now, like I said in the intro, this is a machine that I honestly never thought I'd own. But here it is. It is on my workbench. It's right here in front of me. I've never even seen one in person before until this machine got dropped off to me. And I probably don't need to tell you how excited I am to finally have this machine. Uh, it's certainly not going to be the last time you see the pet on the channel. Um, the next thing I need to look at is some kind of modern storage uh, solution. So something like a SD to pet or a pet SD max or something like that. Um, because let's be honest, I never thought I would own this, let alone um, trying to get my hands on the big dual drive thing that kind of goes along with this. Um, that these things aren't particularly common in Australia as it is. Those things are, well, they're rare as rocking horse shit. But in the process of cleaning this up, there are some questions I'm hoping you can help answer. Um, I am by no means an expert on the Commodore PET. This video has basically been the entirety of my knowledge, uh, kind of learning as I go. The first thing is this, and this is really aimed at anyone from Canberra who happens to be watching this video. And that's the sticker on the side, which I did save. Uh, and that's the Steve's Computers uh, from 68 Wollongong Street in Fishwick. Now, it seems that almost every second Commodore computer I've ever picked up here locally in Canberra has got that sticker. But I know nothing about the company. They were obviously fairly large because, well, they seem to have serviced at least two thirds of the Commodores ever to come to Canberra. But I honestly know nothing about them. The other two questions is probably more for the broader pet owning audience, uh, if you can help me out, because I honestly don't know. In researching the 4032, there seems to be two distinct models. The uh, narrow uh, label one, uh, speaking of, I've got a label already on order from um, coreeye64.com, I think it is, the guy in Canada that does all the stickers. Anyway, I've got one coming, so don't worry. Um, anyway, so there's the narrow sticker case and then there's the wide sticker case. Um, why? What's the difference? Can someone tell me? Um, the other thing is, is that like a lot of early computers, um, the mainboard and the pets has obviously gone through a number of different revisions. Um, this particular machine has obviously got a 4032 sticker on the back of it. Um, and I can tell that the main board was originally wired up for um, 40 column, right? But the motherboard actually has written on it distinctly 80 column CPU board. Again, why? Um, far as I was aware, the universal board in the pet had written on it 40 slash 80 column. Um, why does this only have 80 column? Or is that just typical Commodore just reaching for parts off the shelf? Maybe you can tell me. But for now, that will pretty much do it. Uh, if you like the video, click like, subscribe, all the usual youtube -y stuff. Uh, a big thank you to the British IBM for allowing me to use their music during uh, the cleaning montage. Uh, and as usual, uh, a massive shout out to all my Patreons who are scrolling up the screen right now. Uh, without them, Videos like this simply don't happen, and if you'd like to help support the channel, there is a link in the description. But until then, I'll see you in the next one.